Hello, hello, it's Justin Coletti of Sonic Scoop. Thanks for joining me for this week's episode of the Sonic Scoop podcast. If you're here for the live stream pr- premiere, let me know if you can see me and hear me in the chat box over there. Thanks for joining me. Today, we're gonna be talking all about one of my favorite topics, references. This is something that is so crucially important in developing your skills, whether that's as a mixer, mastering engineer, in producing, honestly, even in writing, arranging, and in songwriting, references can be extremely valuable. What are references and how do you use them? I will tell you right off the bat that all of the best producers and engineers I know, and I've interviewed countless numbers of the best producers and engineers working today over the past decade and a half of interviewing and writing articles and all this stuff. And one thing that they all have in common is that they are constantly listening to great sounding music to get themselves in tune to train their ears and to train their tastes. And there was a book I read on writing once a long time ago by Stephen King. Not even a huge fan of Stephen King's writing, but his book on writing is quite good. And one of the things he says in there is that if you don't have the time or the the tools to read, you don't have the time or the tools to write. And I really feel like producing good music, mixing great sounding records, mastering great sounding records, it's really similar. If you don't make a conscious effort to listen to what great sounding records actually sound like, then you're not going to make great sounding records. Particularly if you're mastering or mixing or just selecting sounds and producing, you're not going to get great sounds unless you listen to great sounding records. Here's the big thing, in the same environment where you work on your own music. And this will give us some insights into how to use references. References, I hope I've impressed on Panya, are so important to one of the biggest things in developing your skills as a producer, as an audio engineer, as a musician even. And there are right and wrong ways to use references. Some people are afraid to use references. Don't use them because they're afraid of using them in the wrong ways. They're afraid that they'll just become copycats. And when I talk about referencing... I'm not talking about becoming a copycat. I'm not talking about doing soundalikes, where you're writing your own song or you're producing your own song, you're mixing your own song and you're copycatting something else trying to sound exactly like it. No, that's not what a reference should be. And there's different ways to use references at different stages in the process. Because if you rely on references too heavily at certain stages in the process, you might end up accidentally going down that path of making bad carbon copies of other stuff. And I'll tell you how to avoid that and also how to do referencing right to get the most out of it. This was inspired by a question that just came in recently. Uh, A guy named Mick wrote in who had recently taken the EQ Breakthroughs course. And he says, thanks so much for the EQ course. It's helping me so much. You mentioned a number of times to make sure that we're listening to great reference material. Can you clarify where to get this great reference material? Are they just like getting a great sounding kick that I like on a recording? And, you know, how would I reference that great sounding kick against my record? How are we actually supposed to use these things? So I want to go in and dive into answering that question, give you a whole bunch of details. Before I give you all the details, the quickest of shout outs to our sponsors. This podcast is free. Thanks to our sponsors. And the most important sponsor, as always, is you. How do you sponsor this podcast? With your likes. I also appreciate your loves, but if you hit uh, like, there's no love button yet on the YouTubes, but if you hit like, if you hit subscribe, if you're on an audio only version and you give us a five-star rating and review, it really does help spread the word. But really the most important way you can sponsor this podcast is by sponsoring yourself. Check out one of our great full-length courses like Mixing Breakthroughs, Mastering Demystified, Compression Breakthroughs, EQ Breakthroughs. If you want to be able to hear, use, and understand compression like you never have before, then definitely check out Compression Breakthroughs. If you want to change the way that you EQ forever, check out EQ Breakthroughs. If you want a whole system for mixing, check out Mixing Breakthroughs. So yeah, that's some of the most useful stuff I've ever done in my entire life. So check out those courses. There's also Mastering Demystified if you want to get into mastering. Also, big shout out and thanks to Sound Toys, making some of my favorite creative mixing effects in the known universe. Try out anything they make for free for 30 days at soundtoys.com. Just a whole bunch of delicious plugins over there. Also, over at Sonic Scoop, 
We are giving away right now one of these microphones I'm talking to right now. This is a Jay-Z Amethyst microphone. It's uh, valued at well over a thousand bucks. Great sounding large diaphragm condenser microphone. Check it out. Sonicscoop.com slash contest. That's sonicscoop.com slash contest. Today is the last day to enter to win this particular contest. But if you're seeing this in the future, hello, future time traveler person. And uh, yeah. That giveaway might not be up anymore, but there's a good chance we have another giveaway up. We give away tens of thousands of dollars worth of free gear every year over at sonicsgroup.com slash contest. So check it out and hopefully you're the lucky person to win this mic. All right, back into it. References, how to use them and what to select as references. So two primary ideas for you here about selecting references. And we're going to get into using references in five different ways. Talk about how to use them in the songwriting and producing and arrangement stage. We'll talk about how to use them in the mixing stage. We'll talk about how to use them in the mastering stage. But that's not the only way to use references. There's two more ways to use references. And that is to really understand your listening environment so you can mix better and master better than in the past. And to get into better sync with your client's tastes. And we'll go into all of those areas. But just as far as selecting references, to answer mixed question directly, there are two different things you want out of references. Number one is you want music that you love the sound of, that you're very familiar with, and that you've heard in a wide range of places. And this is the most important type of reference for tuning yourself to your mixing environment, understanding what your mixing environment really sounds like and getting better translation outside of your studio. I've done um, one of the most popular live stream podcast episodes is called Mixes That Translate. And if you want my top tips for getting mixes that translate outside of your room to other systems, so they sound great in the car, so they sound great when you go to other studios, they sound great when you go to the club, there's a whole bunch of tips in that, uh, tips in that one, uh, Mixes That Translate. But the number one tip is your mixes don't translate because you don't actually know what your mixing environment sounds like. And the way to understand what your room or your headphones really sound like is to listen to music that you love the sound of, that you're familiar with, that you could listen to 10,000 more times before you die, and that you've heard in a wide variety of systems. So you've got to have a set of references that are your general sonic references for tuning yourself to new environments and to tuning your space. You've got to have records that you've heard in your car, in a whole bunch of other places, on a whole bunch of different sets of headphones, on a whole bunch of different sets of speakers. And I have at least five references that I've listened to on literally every single set of speakers or headphones that I've ever auditioned. I have no idea what a new room sounds like, what new headphones sound like, until I've listened to my major references on them. If you guys have references like these, let me know in the comments or in the chat box if you're here for the live. And if enough of you are interested, I could actually do a whole separate episode where I open up my favorite sonic references that I use for tuning room, tuning spaces, tuning myself to the room understanding new systems and we could listen to them together and I'll go through exactly what's in those references that makes them so good at helping me determine what each environment sounds like. So this is the first way to use references, getting to know your space and getting better translation. And that, for that to happen, you need music that you love the sound of, that you're very familiar with, and that you've heard in a wide range of places. That's one type of reference. But it's not the only type of reference. The other major type of reference, number two here, is not just for getting in tune with the space you're in, but is for getting in tune with your client's tastes. And for this, you need something else. This is so important to me as a mastering engineer. I rarely sit in the room with clients anymore. Even when I was in New York City mastering at a big fancy analog studio, we had a big nice couch in the background and we had like free coffee and, you know, nice espresso machine and stuff. Rarely did people actually come into the studio, maybe 10 or 15% of sessions. I wish that more people came into the studio for mastering sessions. If you ever have the chance to, I'd recommend doing it. Uh, It's great to hear your stuff on just a super nice sounding system in a super well-tuned room if you've never had that experience before. But even back then, most of my stuff was remote. I, I could be working with people from uh, France or Israel or you know uh, South Africa or whatever. People sent me stuff from all around the world, and most of those people weren't in the room with me. So, how will I know if the changes that I'm going to make to their master are taking in a direction that's going to please them? Because here's the thing: if you give me a well mixed track, 
there are a number of different things I could do with it. Like there's a range of places where a master could wind up. There's not just one perfect master. You could have a master that sounds great, that, that tilts towards slightly the brighter side, or a master that sounds great, that tilts towards slightly the darker side, or slightly bigger on bottom. And to get in tune with my clients, I need to know what their favorite records sound like. Because they're not there in the space with me, listening to it, saying, ooh, better like this, or better like this. You know, that's what it's like if you do a mastering session and you have a attended session. You're like an audio optometrist. Better like this, better like this, better like this, better like this. But if I can get a sense for, hey, what are your three, what are three of your favorite sounding records that you'd love for this record to stand up on the shelf next to? Then I can listen to those in the space and get a sense for, all right, how much low end is enough low end? Do they like brighter sounding records? Do they like fatter sounding records? Do they like records that are really crushed and pushed to their limit or not? So this is the other big type of reference. References that help you get in tune with your clients. So there's number one, references that help you tune yourself and help you get in tune with the space, the mixing or mastering environment you're in. And there is type number two of reference, references that tune you to the client, that give you a sense for what do your collaborators really love? What can you get on the same page about? And this is relevant even if you're not mastering like I am, or even if you're not mixing, if you're producing with somebody, if you're collaborating with somebody, if you're co-producing with somebody, listening to a bunch of records together and talking about what you like in them is so huge. And it's important that you actually listen to them and talk about them, not talk about them theoretically because, yeah, we've both heard this record and we kind of remember what we're talking about. No, like listen to the record together and talk about exactly what's going on in there if you're about to start collaborating with someone. So records that you mutually love, so important for collaboration, just to, to make sure you're speaking the same language. How do they communicate about music? When they say warm, what does it seem to mean to them? Because it might mean something very different to you. So we've talked about the two primary types of references and the two first major ways to use references. But a lot of you are probably interested in the nuts and bolts more of how do we actually use references in mastering how do we use them in mixing? And how do we use them in those parts of the process that come before? I'll say that in mastering, that's where I get to do, or you would get to do, more direct referencing than in possibly any other part of production. And for you, real quick, I just want to step back for a quick second, because for you, if you're going into an attended session with someone who's going to be mastering for you or mixing for you, you should go through that step one that we just talked about of taking your favorite records, listening to them in the mastering studio or the mixing studio. So you know what that room actually sounds like where that person is making the choices. But for you now doing the work as a mastering engineer, we'll put you in that person's shoes for a moment, and then we'll get to the other stages of the production process in just a second. If you're mastering, here's how it goes. I first ask the clients, what are some of your favorite sounding records? What have you been loving the sound of lately? I want to get a general sense for your tastes in loudness, brightness, low end, et cetera. And if you just give me three records you love the sound of, that'll do it. Now there's a problem here because there's two different types of references that people will give you when you ask them this question. Some people, particularly newer artists, will give you their spiritual references. Others will understand what we're here for. We're trying to get sonic references. What you actually like the sound of, not what music you like. This is different. Because if you come to me making a record in the year, what is it right now, 2024, when I'm recording this, if you're making a record in 2024, 2025, or 2026, and you say, man, oh, references? Yeah, some records I've been loving the sound of lately. I've been loving uh, the Velvet Underground early John Coltrane records and Robert Johnson and the Rolling Stones. It's like, okay, I got it. You love those records. But if I gave you back a record that sounded like early Velvet Underground, sonically, would you be happy with that? Or would you be saying to me, why is it so quiet? And why is there no low end? If I gave you a record that's uh, uh, that actual, a master that actually sounded like the best of Lead Belly, would you be like, oh, that's awesome. My music sounds so sonically rich. Or would you be like, why, how, why did you break my record? So there's a difference between spiritual references, the music that you like, and your sonic references. So 
for this context, when we're talking about production, sound quality, we're looking for sonic references. And here's the thing. Sometimes sonic rec uh, references can be music that you don't even like that much. Your sonic references are those records where you actually think they sound impressive and you want your records to stand up next to those records on a playlist. Not meaning that they should sound exactly like that other record, but if your record comes up after their record, some other single plays and your single plays, yours shouldn't feel blown out of the water. Yours shouldn't feel way too tinny or way too dark and muddied and muffled. That's the kind of thing that we're talking about for sonic references. And as a mastering engineer, those are the kinds of references that I want. I mean awesome if you can get both of those things in one, both your spiritual references and your sonic references, and all of them are mixed together. That's great. But there are some people who are like, man, I don't actually like Nickelback, and I'm not going to listen to Nickelback records, but I have to admit their production sounds awesome, and if I could, you know, get something that has, that goes in the direction of that kind of mass and power, that would be great, even though I don't like their approach to vocals or their lyrics or their songwriting or whatever it is. Um, one record, a uh, uh, gold record is over my shoulder right now. That was my first gold record for mastering. And that one, the artist was in there with me and I was like, oh, what records are you loving the sound of? And he is an indie pop artist and he named all this indie pop stuff, really cool stuff. And, you know, we started mastering the record going in that direction. And he's like, oh, you know, it sounds pretty cool. I just feel like there's something missing. And I'm like, well, well, what do you think you're going to be comparing this to when you leave the studio today? Like, what would you compare this to? Like, what do you love the sound of where you, you wish this record could stand up next to it? And he's like, he practically said to me, like, well, don't tell anyone I told you this. <laughs> Without using those words, I said, well, we're serious now? Okay. Um, I really like the way Justin Bieber's Sorry sounds. And this is, this is a record that sounds nothing like Justin Bieber's Sorry. But we opened it up, listened to that track, and was like, whoa, this record is so wide. It's so much wider than your record. And, oh, listen to what they're doing with the low end. We, we can bring some more of that out. And as soon as we stopped referencing stuff that was in his genre, and we referenced like this pop track that he just loved the texture of, even though he's not a huge Justin Bieber fan, he's like, just, I was texturally blown away by this record. We put it up. We listened to his track against this track. And I was like, okay, let me take a little bit of what you're getting out of this and try to extract some of that same stuff. Meaning you're just giving me the license to go wider than I would have considered going, to go a little bit bigger on bottom than I would have considered going, to go a little bit smoother on top and accent a different part of the upper mid range than I would have been. Maybe we're accenting more 8K instead of 5K. And I got those cues from it. And I went in that direction. He's like, awesome. And to, my, to this day, it's one of my favorite sounding uh, masters I've worked on. It was a great sounding mix to begin with. Uh, producer Ario Lowe did a great job on it. And uh, I think that one has just gone platinum as of this year. Uh, a song called Beige by an artist called Yolklore, if you want to look it up. And that was the first uh, gold record that I ever uh, mastered myself. And it all came from, the only reason it sounds as good as it does is partly because it's a great song and a great production, but that, that final little bit of, you know, 10 or 20% that we added in mastering, the only reason we added, you know, 20% instead of 2% to it was because he got honest about what his sonic references were, what he really wanted the record to sound like and what it really could and should sound like. So yeah, referencing outside of your genre is okay. When I'm looking for sonic references and mastering, I want to get a sense for what bottom end is uh, ideally going to sound like to you, top end with the depth, those kinds of things, sonic references. That's what I'm looking for. And to do that in mastering, I've got to do a little bit of A-B comparison occasionally. Now, different people have different minds about this. My mastering mentor, Joel Lambert, does not master in that way where he'll do A-B comparisons. Um, he really says he doesn't reference, but I know he does reference. The way that he references is he listens to a ton of great sounding music in his room. Between two albums he might master in one day. He listened to some music just to retune himself. And he'll listen to, you know, his own picks that he think are, are, are relevant to the style of what he's working on. So he's constantly referencing, but he doesn't call it referencing because he's not doing a being and it's more about tuning himself um, and listening to music that he think is, is appropriate to listen to for the, the task of the day. Um, and that's how I've known Joe to, to, to reference is just to listen to records in his studio environment. He loves listening to records. And me, I'm a little different. I like to be a little bit more of a chameleon, get inside the head of the artist. And that's my favorite way to do it, is to ask them for 
their references. All right, a couple other ways to use referencing. Like I said, in mastering, it can potentially be okay to do a little bit of A-B and A-B comparison. And the thing that I'm trying to do when I master is not to match a reference exactly. Usually my thing is I want at least three records and I can get a sense if I do a quick A-B between things, I can say, okay, am I even basier than the basiest of the references? If so, I'm probably too basy. Am I even brighter than the brightest of the references? If so, it's probably too bright. Does this mix sound narrower than, you know, the narrowest of their references? Maybe it needs to get widened out a bit more. So those are the kinds of things I'm listening for. And if I'm A-Bing, I'm usually A-Bing between like just a quick sip test between three different things. Just double check. All right, where is my low end? Oh, my low end's a little hot compared to practically everything. But then every once in a while, there'll be those cases where I get a reference and it's like, the record already sounds so close to one of these records in production style that I can kind of just get rid of the other couple. They're outliers. And the one that we're already so close to, that's kind of what they're intending. So I'll just do a double check against it to just make sure I'm not wildly off as far as bottom end and brightness. So generally speaking, I'm not trying to do sound alikes. I'm not trying to match other records. Now, with that said, every once in a while I do. I think one of the best ways to get really good at EQing, to get really good at mastering, to get really good at mixing, is to every once in a while do a mix matching or master mimicking approach. Where in the master, you just say, hey, if someone if someone gave me this track and I was supposed to fit it on the same album with one of these references, what would I have to do to make it fit? What would I have to do to make it feel like it seamlessly goes from this reference into our track and they're, because they're supposed to end up on one album together? They were recorded and produced in different environments, but we're supposed to have them end up on the same album together. And there's albums that do that. You listen to a Beck album, you know, uh, at least some Beck albums, something like Odelay or uh, Mellow Gold, and there's so many different production aesthetics in there, yet they're masters so that they go one into the other. What if we did that kind of thing? Or what if we tried to match the frequency envelope of a particular song? Even if you don't use that, it's a great way to stretch your hearing ability and to learn to EQ, to learn to mix, to learn to master better. And I'm not saying you should mimic stuff and then put it out, although every once in a while I, I have, but every once in a while it's a great exercise to just say, could I do it? And if you're totally lost as to how to mimic something else in EQ curve, then you need to learn how to EQ even better if, if you want to be mastering. So that can be a useful exercise. And every once in a while it can be useful to actually do. If I'm totally lost on a master, I'll say to myself, well, what would happen if I tried to totally match this other track? Like, what direction would that take me in? And it could give me ideas about what I'd ultimately do to it. Now, sometimes it's way too extreme. A lot of mastering jobs should be really subtle and we're making half dB changes and dB changes at most. But um, some mastering jobs something's not right at the mastering stage and you dig in a little bit harder. And then that either allows you to say, hey, I dug in and now it sounds great. Or I'm finding that I have to dig in a lot. Maybe there's a problem in the mix and I can give the client some feedback. Like, hey, here's an issue I was running into. Um, this is the best I could do. Tell me what you think about it. But I feel like if you tweak this one thing, we wouldn't run into that problem and you might like the result even better. So that's my long-winded way of talking about how to use references and mastering. And I wanted to go at length on that one, A, because it's what I do and what I'm most experienced with these days, but also because it's the most involved process. I think referencing when you're mixing, when you're producing, and when you're recording are slightly different. And they're slightly simpler. So let's get to the, the next one here, the next most complicated, that is a lot simpler, and that is how to use references when you're mixing. It actually is, again, great as a educational tool, learning tool to say, hey, if I did want to match the kind of mix that's in one of my favorite references in my own mix, what would I have to do? That can be a great exercise to say, let me try panning the same way they are. Let me try putting my snare drum at the same level of loudness and brightness as they are. Trying to match those things exactly can be a great way to learn, but I don't think it's a great way to mix. Your mixing ultimately should serve the song your mixing ultimately shouldn't be trying to copycat someone else's mix that serves some other song. And mixing isn't all about sonics. Mixing is about enhancing the emotional arc of the song, 
making sure that the listener gets to focus on the most important thing in any section. Are you doing the right triage where you're saying, like, hey, right now, this moment in this song, the most important thing is X. Our most important couple of elements are the vocal and the snare drum in this section. Or maybe in this section, the most important thing is the, the kick drum rhythm in the vocal. Or the most important thing, it isn't the vocal. It's actually about the guitars and the snare drum. Making those kinds of judgments that serve the song and serve the uh, direct the listener's attention into whatever is going to give them the biggest emotional payoff, that's your job as a mixer, even more than sonics are your job. Now, sonics are also your job. And we, we all, all things being equal, we'd love tall, deep, wide sounding mixes. But that's secondary to mixes that enhance whatever is the most emotionally important and musically important in the song at any given moment. So in that context, assuming that we're not trying to match some other mix, how do we use references? Well, here's what I recommend. You mix the song to the best of your ability, hopefully using something like the principles in my Mixing Breakthroughs course. Hey, hey, I'm going to put this one back on screen again. There you go. Mixing Breakthroughs. Check that out. If you want a whole system to mixing, they'll give you a roadmap to figuring out how to mix. It really does change people's lives. And there's a 30-day money-back guarantee on it, so I recommend it uh, to the ends of the earth. Mixing Breakthroughs. Definitely check it out. But you mix the the song to the best of your ability. And then once you've gotten, you know, 80% of the way there, this might be an appropriate time to do some additional referencing because you've run into a problem. So I would say that mix referencing is best to happen both A, in the beginning, before you start mixing, just listen to some great sounding mixes in your studio. So you have a sense for what your North Star is, what good sounds like in your room. Use that first step, that tuning yourself process. And if you're mixing with someone else in collaboration, hopefully you've done that second step of hearing some of their favorite records to get in tune with what they really like. But then after that, when you're 80% of the way through the mix and you're running into problems, you're asking yourself questions. How loud should my snare drum be? Should I be emphasizing the kick over the bass or the bass over the kick? Should my vocal be louder or quieter than it is now? This is a time to bring up one or two or three relevant references to the style you're working in and ask the question of their mixes. Well, how did they handle that? How hot is their vocal compared to their snare drum? How hot is their vocal and snare drum compared to everything else? And you might find either A, some commonalities between all those references that are common between them, but is uncommon in yours. And by listening to two or three references, you might say, whoa, in this style that I'm working in, I can actually push the vocal way hotter than I am. Why do I have it so buried? These vocals are huge compared to mine. Why am I not doing that? And that might lead you in the direction of making the vocal bigger. And it might also lead you to ask, well, why am I afraid to put my vocal so loud? Is it because when I do, sometimes it jumps out at me and sometimes it feels too loud when I put it at an appropriate level of loudness? Oh, there's something going on that's not happening in my mix. It's happening in all theirs. Their vocals are way more compressed. And that's why they can get away with having it up there is because it's so compressed that it never gets much hotter than that level. It just gets there and stays there. So you might realize by listening to references, hey, my vocal's way under-compressed, my vocal's way dark, and it's way quiet. That's one set of things you might find out. Or you might find out, oh, my snare drum, it's way too dark, way too muffled, way too quiet. Or you might find exactly the opposite. (laughs) I was getting really happy there, making that uh, the the vocals bright and the snare drum bright. Uh, They could practically take your head off. I've overcorrected now in this direction. When I really listen to what my favorite records sound like, I'm pushing them way more than they need to be in this genre. You might be mixing and you've handled your background vocals in a certain way and your background vocals are super loud and super wide and they sound awesome. But then you listen to a whole bunch of your favorite records in this style. Maybe it's, uh, you know, rock records. And if you're listening to rock records, you might say, why do my guitar sound so small? And you listen to some rock records and you go, oh, wait a second. Part of the reason their guitar sounds so much bigger than mine is because they're not letting the background vocals dwarf their guitars. 
So I've got to make a choice here. There's a battle in my mix. What do I want to have be the hugest thing? Should it be the background vocals or should it be the guitars? And usually, on average, different genres will have different answers. So in more of a pop mix, the answer is usually going to be background vocals win, background vocals beat guitars. The guitar is doing some rhythmic thing or it's doing a a cool little melody ear candy line, but the background vocals are like the point in this section, in this spot. Where in a rock record, it might be the other way around. You put in these big, beautiful, pop-sounding background vocals, but it's making your band sound weak and small and tiny. And this is one of the reasons that background vocals are often mixed quieter on rock records than they are on pop records, because you want the band to sound big, you want the guitars to sound huge, you want the drums to sound huge, and the huger you make the background vocals, the smaller those things sound. So there's that battle, there's that trade-off. And if you listen to mixing references and ask the question about, what are the differences between my mix and their mix? How are they handling these things that I'm not? Now, also, if you want to go deep on some of these ideas, I've been doing a series on this channel recently called, um, either called Mix Breakdowns or What Makes This Mix Great? I want to call it What Makes This Mix Great. And then I found out that Rick Beato has a thing called What Makes This Song Great. I think it's Rick Beato. And I'm like, oh, can I not use that name? I think I have to use it anyway. Uh, what makes this mix great? And if we have about a half dozen of those so far. I want to do at least one of these a month. I might do more like two of them a month. It's so much fun to listen to records like that and really analyze what they're doing, what choices they're making in the mix. But the best way to do this is when I do mix feedback sessions, I'll do one-on-one coaching calls with clients and we can listen in this way, listen to their favorite records and then listen to um, their, listen to their own work and listen to their favorite records against them. So we can get a sense for how does your record sound? How do your favorite mixes actually sound? Uh, one of the differences between your mix and practically all of your favorite mixes is your kick drum has way too much sub energy in it or way too little, or your kick drum doesn't have enough click on it, or your vocals are too quiet, or your vocals aren't compressed enough, or your symbols are too bright and sibilant relative to everything else that's too dark. These are some common things that might come up in mixes. Um, If you want the really inexpensive version of that, you can become a member of this YouTube channel for just five bucks a month, and you can get access to our members-only mix feedback sessions. I'll do these epic three to four hour sessions where we'll listen to a whole bunch of uh, your mixes and a whole bunch of um, your favorite mixes from a whole bunch of uh, members, and we'll compare members' mixes to members' favorite sounding records, and uh, I'll give my general advice on you know what to address in their mix, and I'll often make some mastering changes in real time so they can hear some EQ changes. Hey, when I say you got too much 60 hertz in the kick drum, here's what it sounds like when we tuck that, and here's what it sounds like when we widen it out, and stuff like that, so you can get a sense. So consider clicking the join button right here on this YouTube video. If you're on an Apple iOS device, there may not be a join button. You may have to go into the description, your browser, and click there uh, to join. But right now, it's super cheap, just five bucks a month. I think that I'm going to soon raise that to 10 bucks a month because the number of people that have joined, there's 70 of you now in the member section, and the number of mixes that are coming in, I think I'm going to have to increase the price so I can hopefully cut down (laughs) the number of mixes I'm supposed to get through uh, when we do these. But for right now, it's just five bucks a month. So definitely check that out. So this is a great way to use them in mixing. First, get in tune with your space, your listening environment, know what it sounds like. That's going to help you with translation. Um, tune, get in tune with your collaborators by having some favorite records that you're going to compare, that you agree on, like, we love these records, and then figure out which direction you're going to go and based on that. And then when you run into problems or are asking questions in your mix about how to handle when you're second guessing something, should my vocal be up or down? listen to a few relevant mixes and see how they handle the vocal, see how hot they pushed it and see which one of those grabs you the most and which might be most appropriate for you. So that's the way I think to use it in mixing. Then there is this last item, which is recording and producing. How do you use references in recording and producing? And here, I think it's similar to mixing, but with less A being. I think that when you're recording and producing, you're often using uh, other reference material to get your ears in tune. Because one of the great things that happens when you've tuned your ears to great sounding records in your space is it encourages you to push your own sounds further and to make every sound that you record or every sound that you select if you're producing electronically 
to make every one of those sounds sound more like a finished record from moment one. Instead of settling for overly muffled or dark or tinny or underwhelming sounds, just getting great sounding finished commercial work into your ears before you even begin your process, it will help push you in the direction of hyping things up a little bit more, being a little bit more exciting, and not settling for a sound that you're going to fix later. And then I think it also comes in handy when you're trying to decide on a specific sound, like when you're not sure what direction to go in with a guitar or with a bass, to again reference in the same way that we've talked about in mixing, to pull up just as an ear break, again, some of your favorite sounding records throughout the day. You were doing some bass takes, you didn't love the tone, whatever it was, you didn't love the samples you were selecting, that the next time you're taking a break, you refresh yourself again by listening to some relevant records. And here, I don't recommend doing the A-B as much at all, but I recommend it as being a constant retuning. That in between some of your sound selection, you listen to other great sounding records. And this is more important for the producer or for the engineer than for the artist. You might not actually want to listen to a ton of other people's music if you are the artist. You might not necessarily want to blow the band out with how these other records sound. But you, as a producer or engineer, might need to retune yourself. But you might want to keep the artist out of that. So they're not thinking musically about other people's performances, about being overly influenced by one person or another. And this is where I recommend playing references a little closer to the, the chest. Where the musicians are going to be listening to those things as musical references. And they might get into this idea of comparing their voice to someone else's voice, comparing their playing, comparing the musical statement they're trying to make to someone else's musical statement. When all you're trying to do with these references is to remind yourself of sonically how things work, should work in your space. And there, it might be a little bit more private. You kind of kick the band out. <laughs> so you could listen to references there. They go out and get some lunch. You stay behind and you listen to some records in there. There may be people you work with, though, who are also producery savvy in this way and can handle this process and can separate the music from the sound. The craft of sculpting good sounds from the art of making great music. But not everyone's necessarily capable of that at all times as a musician. So that's more for the producers in the room. All right, I hope some of this makes sense to you. Though That's the way that I think about using references. Five major different ways to tune yourself to your space, to tune yourself to your clients. Using them in mastering, occasionally doing some A being to double check where you are for low end, where you are for width, where you are for high frequency. Where is the brightness that's in the track distributed? Is it more the lower highs or more the higher highs? Is it more the upper mids or more the center mids? Those kinds of things. Mixing, tuning yourself to the space, and then occasionally during the mixing process, doing some A Bs when you run into problems in your mix to say to yourself, how did they solve the problem of how loud the vocal should be relative to the snare drum, of how loud the bass should be relative to the kick, of whether the kick should be deeper than the bass or the bass should be deeper than the kick? How did they handle those questions in some of my favorite mixes? And you might have three different mixes that are relevant to you, and two of them are irrelevant, but one of them gives you a fresh perspective on how you could approach it in your own mix and gives you a reality check on what your own mix sounds like compared to others. And then the recording and producing stage, where you're just reacclimating yourself to what finished records really sound like to inspire you to push in that direction and get tones that sound good at the source. But being careful around people who are artists and not producers or engineers about playing too much of other people's music as part of the recording and producing process. But there are some people who are artists in arranging and in recording and in producing, they might be open to that kind of thing. But at the very least, those people should still probably listen to some of their favorite records in the space before recording to, so at least they know what things sound like in that space. Because you got to tune yourself to the environment. 
That's about it. The last quick mention I want to make here about sonic references, we talked about the difference between spiritual references and sonic references, but there's one more variable I did not mention that's super important in making sure you select the correct sonic references. And that is both stylistic relevance, but just as important and even more important maybe, tempo relevance. Tempo relevance is huge. So, Style relevance is important because if you're trying to mix a rock record and you first listen to a whole bunch of EDM tracks and you apply EDM mixing norms to rock records, your rock records aren't going to sound like rock records. And they might sound overly scooped. You might not have enough mid-range. Your guitars might end up feeling dwarfed by the drums. The way the vocal sits in the mix, everything is just totally different. So you want to pick stuff that's stylistically relevant. And and same thing, if you're doing EDM records or you're doing hip-hop records and you listen to a whole bunch of rock records, you know, you might end up with an overly mid-rangey sounding record and your kick drum might not be big enough and so on and so forth. But another big thing when you're referencing is tempo relevance. Don't be misled by tracks that are in a totally different tempo. If your track is 90 BPM and one of your references here is 180 BPM, that's a problem. And it doesn't even have to be that big of a difference. You're working on a track that's 90 BPM and you're listening to tracks that are 120 BPM. That's a problem. Because generally speaking, faster tracks, more up-tempo tracks, will sound brighter and should sound brighter than darker tracks and more down-tempo tracks. When there's more space in between each beat, there's more room to put in low end and low mid range, and things can sound fuller and fatter and beefier in a slower down tempo mix, where they could never sound that way in a mix that's you know fifty percent faster. And even if they were EQ'd the same, just the tempo will make the bright track sound brighter in a way. But also just the approach to them, like what's possible in a certain mix. If there's so little space between each rhythmic hit, those tracks generally need to be mixed brighter so you can hear everything clearly enough. And they also lend themselves being mixed brighter. There's this energy and immediacy and spunk about them that suggests going in that direction. So if you're working on a down-tempo track and you're listening to a whole bunch of up-tempo tracks, you might be encouraged to go brighter than you should and vice versa. If you're listening to a whole bunch of down-tempo tracks and you're working on an up-tempo track, you might be encouraged to go fatter and thicker with it than you possibly should. So that's the last major consideration I want to give you. Generally speaking, we've got two different types of references. Music you love the sound of and you're familiar with, that's how you tune yourself to new environments and how you make sure you understand your listening space. But the other big thing being music that you love the sound of or your clients love the sound of that's relevant to what you're working on. And that means both stylistically relevant and tempo relevant. You need tracks that are somewhat appropriate in tempo compared to what you're working on. All right, I hope some of that makes sense to you. Let me know what are some of your favorite reference tracks. And it would be would it be useful to you if I did a whole episode where I bring up, you know, five of my favorite references that I've listened to in every studio, on every set of speakers, and every set of headphones I've ever auditioned, and tell you exactly why I think they work as sonic references for me and what I'm listening for in them so that you can start listening for those things too. I'd love to get a sense for uh, what you guys use for references. So let me know and let me know if that episode would be useful for you. Last quick shout out and thanks to you for sponsoring this podcast. If you've watched this long, you have already sponsored it with your watch time. However, you can sponsor it even more by smashing the bejesus out of that like button. If you've gotten this far, my goodness, you got to be hitting the like button. Come on. And if you've gotten that this far, it means you don't mind hearing me talk for extended periods of time. Even when it's like totally extended parading, it's like off the top of my head. None of this is scripted out. I have a few bullet points of the things I want to talk about. What if this guy who you don't mind hearing talk for this long, what if he had a full structured edited course where like every single minute was designed to make you better at mixing? where there's a ton of audio examples, we can hear this stuff, and I've created a roadmap for you that will change the way that you mix forever for the better, guaranteed, or your money back. Such a thing does exist, and it is in fact called Mixing Breakthroughs. You got to check it out over at mixingbreakthroughs.com. If you've already checked out this one, uh, some of my other courses, EQ Breakthroughs, it will change the way you hear and use EQ forever for the better. Compression Breakthroughs, you will start hearing and using compression like a pro, no question about it, or your money back guaranteed. Even if you get, these are like eight and nine hour courses, but even if you get through the first 90 minutes of them, I guarantee that the way that you work will be changed forever for the better 
or your money back. I wouldn't even know about it. If you ask for your money back, someone at support just gives you your money back and that's that. And I don't even ever know about it. So you don't have to worry about hurting my feelings. So go check those out. Mixing breakthroughs, compression breakthroughs, EQ breakthroughs, mastering demystified. Um, start with mixing breakthroughs if you have to start with one of them, unless you really are excited about learning compression or EQ or mastering, and then um, check out one of those. Also, big shout out thanks to Sound Toys, making some of my favorite creative mixing effects in the known universe. Try out anything they make for free for 30 days over at soundtoys.com, or don't, because if you try them out, you're going to want to buy them. They're just that awesome. And last but not least, we are giving away one of these microphones. This is a Jay-Z Amethyst microphone. And right now, if you go over to sonicscoop.com, but go to sonicscoop.com slash contest. That's sonicscoop.com slash contest. We're giving away one of these. This is your last chance to enter. So good luck. One of you is going to win that. And we give away more than $10,000 worth of tens of thousands of dollars. We probably give away close to $100,000 worth of free gear every year and have for the past decade. So check that out over at sonicscoop.com slash contest. There's one day left to enter to win this one. Thanks for hanging out with me. This has been Justin Coletti of Sonic Scoop. See you next time.